Good evening and a very warm welcome to our tonight's program, Talking Objects of Narrative Objects and Collection Narratives, as part of the exhibition by Georges Adiakbo, La Lumière qui fait le bonheur, on show at Kindle Center for Contemporary Art until 25th of July. Don't miss it. Our program today is a cooperation uh, with, with uh, the series Talking Objects Lab. And I am very much uh, looking forward to tonight's conversation between um, Marit Ifoma Kupka, Isabel Rabe, and Azu Babuku. My name is Katja Künast, and on behalf of the Kindle, I would like to welcome the digital audience and our speakers tonight. Isabel Rabe is a curator and project developer from Berlin. Her curatorial and artistic strategies aim to deconstruct Western perspectives and traditions of thought. Uh, one of her bigger projects has been the quite uh, successful ROM archive, digital archive of the Roma, which won the European Heritage Award 2019 and the Grimme Online Award 2020. Recently, she initiated the project Talking Objects. Uh, she and Marit uh, Ifumakupka will present the project in a moment, so I will only mention it now. Um, Marit Ifumakupka is an art scholar, freelance writer, and since 2013, she is curator of fashion, body, and performance at the Museum Angewandte Kunst in Frankfurt am Main. She works in different formats and in her exhibitions, lectures, texts, and interdisciplinary projects, uh, she addresses issues of, amongst others, memory, culture, representation, and the decolonization of art and cultural practices in Europe and on the African continent. Marit Ifo Makurka is, together with Isabel Rabe, curator of the Chalking Objects Lab, and the past events, uh, events uh, which can be looked up on the website and the blog, which I highly recommend, leave me very excited about tonight. I'm sure we will hear a lot more about this project in the years to come. Finally, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to tonight's guest, Azu Wabugu. Uh, Wabugui is the founder and director of the African Artists Foundation, AAF, based in Lagos, Nigeria, that is dedicated to the promotion and development of contemporary African arts and artists. He created Art Based Africa, a virtual space to discover and learn about contemporary art from the African content and the diaspora. He is on the jury of major arts awards and committees internationally, and he works as an independent curator and art critic. Azu Wabugu serves as founder and director of the Lagos Photo Festival, and in tonight's uh, conversation, he will introduce the Home Museum Lagos, a private collection of photographs gathered through an open call as part of the Lagos Photo Festival. And um, with this, I'm very much looking forward to the talk, and I hand over to um, Marit Ifuma Kupka. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, Azu Wabogu, for being here with us tonight. Um, Isabel Rabe and I would like to talk with you about decolon decolonizing knowledge and memory. This process is a major topic of the Talking Objects Lab, a joint project, a think tank and exhibition series in Germany, Kenya, Senegal, and probably Nigeria that Isabel and I are currently working on together with artists and scholars from the African continent and its diasporas. Um, at this very moment, we are at another peak I would say, of a debate that has been going on for decades, a debate about the colonial pasts of the major European nations and the handling of provenance, restitution, and the return of looted objects from colonial context. And Germany just agreed to return Benin bronzes to Nigeria. And um, 
let's see how and if other European museums follow that step and how this gesture will turn out in the end. With the Talking Objects Lab, we aim to bundle current debates and contribute to finding fundamental new ways of looking at so-called objects, their care, meaning, and exhibition or non-exhibition. And I think we will get back to that later. In European museums, it is primarily the objects that tell their colonial history in terms of violence, theft, and being snatched from complex contexts. The original context and significance involved are barely represented in the museum, while in some instances it is not even possible to find them there because they were not known or were never known and are frequently even lost, not to mention erased. Furthermore, there is the issue of whether the contextual meaning could ever have been portrayed in a museum, whether there <clears throat> processual quality would even have contradicted the idea of turning objects into museum exhibits. What prospects do we have nowadays to rediscover such contextual meaning? And um, I hope we're going to discuss that a bit later on. Colonial history has become a part of the objects, yet it is not the entire history we wish to contribute in order that the histories become more complete fill the gaps, heal still open wounds. We depend on the diverse narratives that exist among ourselves for each other and also about one another to be able in the end to, um, to create a more comprehensive understanding of the world and of coexistence. I think your home museum, Azu, is a great example for that and also the other project you will present in a bit before that, Isabel will introduce a bit more detailed what we do, what the Talking Objects Lab is about, how it is going to work. She will also introduce our website, the digital home of the lab. And after that, Azu, you will introduce your current projects. And then we will dive into our discussion, I hope. Thank you. And I'm handing over to you, Isabel, now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marit. So, um... I will guide you through our website and we'll tell you a bit more about the Talking Objects project. Um, let me briefly share my screen. Um, wait a minute. So this is, do you see my screen? Is this working? Yes. So, um, yeah, Talking Objects, the project is about, um, it's aiming to negotiate what knowledge can be today beyond the Eurocentric um, knowledge systems, uh, beyond the European wide view on the world. And as you can see um, already here with all these relations and connections, we are following a very holistic approach, trying to uh, to find polyperspectivity, to uh, to show the huge relations, the interrelations, the network, the uh, what Boaventura de Souza Santos, uh, the Portuguese academic calls interknowledge. Um, I'm going to show you. Wait a minute, I have to. Yeah, okay. Talking Objects is about. Um, two columns actually, it's the Talking Objects Lab, a series of events of exhibitions and think tanks, which will take place in Germany, in Senegal and in Nairobi, and the Talking Objects Archive, which to which I come back um, in a few minutes. Um, we are actually following five thematic fields. Um, I can show you here. So this is a mind map where you can see, yeah, also again, these inter interconnections between everything we are looking for. And basically we are following five, uh, five main topics. It's decolonizing memory. What do we mean by this? It's what history do we remember? How can collective memory be decolonized? Um, are collections, museums and archives still useful as guardians of our memory? We look at the body as an archive. Then it's decolonizing knowledge. Uh, so 
we are aiming for this polyperspectivity I was already talking about, how can other knowledge systems like the non-academic knowledge, sensoric knowledge, spirituality uh, juxtapose the Western academic knowledge. And decolonizing knowledge also means decolonizing the archive. And I'm um, very much looking forward to, to the project. Azu, you will, um, you will tell us a bit more about, um, which is also about what can an arc, what is an archive actually, and how does a decolonial archive um, look like that juxtapose the Western concept of an archive, which is a very hegemonic one. Um, re Re-evaluation of objects from colonial context is something we're looking we're looking for, and we demand really a radical change of perspectives in this regards. A radical change of perspective on ethnographic um, objects, or even ethnographic objects, the so-called. Um, and we want to listen. We want to listen to the objects. What can they tell us? How can we make this polyphonic narratives resound? And also, what does the absence of the objects? or subjects mean not only for the local societies, but also for the objects themselves. How did they change during their time in European museums? Another um, really very important um, field is the contemporary art, power and empowerment of artistic perspectives in this regard. Uh, we see art as an important tool of knowledge production, a tool of resistance. And as curators, we do not make any distinction between academic or artistic knowledge. They are of equal value for us. And then last but not least, we are questioning the classical forms of museum practices, of preservation, of possession, of presentation. And that's what we surely come back in our discussion uh, later. Um, the lab, the Talking Objects Lab, will follow up all these questions. We just had a kickoff event called Unexpected Lessons, Decolonizing Memory and Knowledge three weeks ago uh, here in Berlin, in parallel in Nairobi and in the internet. It's still, the live stream is still online here on our blog, talkingobjectslab.org, where we fan out all these important and heavy uh, topics, which will be followed um, in exhibitions and think tanks in all these countries uh, later on. This all leads to the archive, to the Talking Objects archive, um, which is um, a digital archive for decolonial knowledge production aimed to go online in 2024. And it will use a collection of curated objects to fan out this polyperspective view on knowledge starting from the object. So the object is the link to this, um, to this new cosmology of, of knowledge, taking into consideration oral history, African philosophies, um, African history, pre-colonial history, the meaning of loss, uh, the artistic um, reflections on it, as I already mentioned, but also anthropology and ethno ethnology um, from a Western perspective, um, spirituality, traditions, and uh, cultural heritage, handicraft in the sense of, yeah, we will talk later about this this object between a handicraft, an artifact, um, something, a tool for daily, for daily life. Um, that's what the archive will be. I can um, briefly show you the team. It's, it's Maret and me as curators and initiators of this project. Uh, we have a wonderful team in Nairobi, Jim Chu Chu and Joaquin Gumi from the Nest Collective, uh, as well as Chao Tayana from African Digital Heritage and Open Restitution Africa Initiative, who also who, she will also bring this digital aspect in. Um, and Malik Ndiaye from Dakar, uh, he's curator at the Musée Théodore Monod and researcher at IFAN, uh, Institut Fondamental d'Afrique Noire. Uh, let me briefly come back to one. Um, one topic which is always accompanying our work. Um, it's, where is it? <laughs> it's healing. It's it's the topic of healing. Um, it's the headline also of an interview Maret and me, me gave. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's a very important topic. Um, healing, as we know, is about following a holistic approach. So we also understand the decolonization labor also as an emotional labor, as 
besides the fact of deconstructing, dismantling, there's always also, always this aspect of, of about, um, Marit, you called it making complete, um, about looking at the trauma, the violence, the loss, and, and trying to, to make things complete again by following this, this uh, process of healing. I think this is very important. I'm very much looking forward as a to, to what you what you um, tell us about. We talked about it briefly in, in a um, previous talk. So um, I'm going to stop the sharing of the screen. You can find everything we do on our blog. We are trying to document everything um, that has been and that will come up uh, in the blog. Um, you have interviews with people we work with, with academics and artists and um, yeah, follow follow up the work of the lab in the next in the next years. So I hand over to Azu now. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation of um, what what you're working on currently. Um, thank you. Thank you, Marat. If I'm a Kupka, and thank you, Isabel Rabe. Thank you to Kindle for having me on this panel. Um, I'm really excited to be sharing some of the ideas that we have been developing as a, as a team and myself as an independent curator. Um, I just wanted to sort of start by highlighting the role of contemporary art in, and its um, complicity, if you like, in um, <clears throat> enabling or fostering um, the, what you can call a, a demixing, if you like, of knowledge and um, how we can sort of Put to uh, be vigilant because uh, contemporary art really is almost at the center of all of these new forms of knowledge generation, at, and it really feeds itself from it. And um, so, when I left South Africa as the when my role, previous role as the director of the Zeitzmoker Museum and the chief curator, I thought I really spent a lot of time thinking about the ways in which contemporary museums and future museology in Africa is sort of enabling these problematics of and the hierarchies that we've inherited um, and the ways we understand museums to function. And I was concerned about how the modern ways of collecting sort of reproduce the sort of colonial violence in terms of cosmology and the objects that the, the artists produce. And, um, and I still believe that uh, artists and art has a very important healing potential. Uh, it does not have to do that. We do not need to give artists the responsibility and the burden to do this, but we are fully aware that artists, just by being artists in their processes are able to um, remedy these situations. And um, so if you could start by sharing my slide, please. Um, uh, I believe the first slide would be the um, the idea of unpacking the suitcase. And um, I don't know if you can see it or am I alone? Or shall I share my screen? Hmm. We can see it. Can see it. Okay. Okay. Okay, because I can't see it. Sorry. Mm. Okay, and um, and so we we got to the point where we're really truly interested in how do we find a new logic, and how do we the um, think about new ways of collecting, and how do how do we change the narrative? How do we sort of flip the moral conundrum on its head so that we have a new way of building knowledge generation because our cosmology and our sense of place in the world is really shaped by the objects that artists produce and we produce and we consume. And if museums have a role, a civic role to play, um, how are we sort of aligning ourselves with the people and not with commerce or industry and that sort of thing. And so um, we, um, we spent time thinking about this as a collective and as a group and as a foundation. 
And we invited um, Dr. Clementine Delis, who is a curator that had worked at the, as the director at the World Culture and Museum in Frankfurt. And um, in February of 20, 2020, and she traveled around Nigeria with us visiting municipal Konok uh, museums that were set up in pre-colonial times. And the process of visiting these museums really sparked an interest in the methodology that we might use to take a side road towards restitution, another reword that is very packed and loaded. And we're interested in the repatriation, the restitution, the remediation, the, the repair, if you like, of the current methodologies that we find to be problematic. And you cannot begin to repair something if you do not identify the problems. Mm -hmm. And so the investigation that we had visiting this museum, we realized that there were a lot of interesting objects, a lot of not just traditional African art or artifacts from pre built from 500 years ago, but also incredible collection um, of modern art in the archive. And not just the shiny celebrated binning bronzes, but also objects for ecology, for survival, objects that have an intelligence that we are not tapping into in them. And today, the biggest problem that the world is faced with really is the problem of ecology, the problems of climate change. And all over the world, First Nation people, indigenous people, local people have an intelligence and a way of dealing with um, these massive issues because they, there's a there's an awareness that we are custodians. So, but with the colonial comes capitalism and ownership and profit and expansion. And so one of the first things that we begin to learn is through these objects, we can start finding new ways of generating knowledge. And through, and, and that's what's the, and then through photography and through photographing these objects, we're able to at least accelerate somewhat the process of restitution. We don't think we've solved the problem, but we begin to at least look at these objects and begin to mm -hmm. find new ways of learning. And so I'm going to quickly, you know, so we, we uh, I'm going to quickly just sort of skip through. We developed a home museum idea. And if you go on the website, uh, homemuseum.net, you'll be able to browse and understand what we've done because of time. I'm going to try and keep it really short so I can tell you a little bit more about how we're working within the framework of restitution using a microcosm or, or a case study. So this is the, um, uh, the project that I'm going to speak about today. And um, so the first slide is, you have the unpacking the suitcase, the, the journey of Prince Emmanuel Adewale Oyenuga. And um, the next slide gives you uh, a bit of information about um, the call we had for the Home Museum, which was launched during the pandemic. We had actually designed the idea just before the lockdown. And then during the lockdown, it, you know, it seemed like uh, it seemed very prescient because we couldn't go out to museums. The next slide, please. We couldn't, we couldn't go out to visit um, uh, art centers, museums, galleries, whatever. So we had to find a way to um, bypass this problem. And we invited, we designed, uh, we designed a letter, inviting artists, we invited citizens, invited normal people who are trapped and, and syncopated at home to make uh, images with smartphones, uh, with anything they could find of objects of virtue. And we believe that by doing this, we're able to spark a civic interest in the quest, burning question of restitution. And we begin to at least begin to find a way to begin to do the, the re remediation, repair, restitution, uh, restoration of heritage. And um, the next slide, please. I'm not sure what slide they're on now because I'm, I can't see it, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm hoping that we- The suitcase now. I don't know, we see the suitcase now, or is it the next? Right, okay, mm -hmm. see the suitcase. Um, so um, in January of, um, the next slide, please. In January of 2021, we received a letter, I received a letter 
-hmm. a very beautifully written letter from Anna Biangas, um, a native of Barcelona, who hosted a Nigerian artist who was studying at the prestigious Escola Masana in Barcelona in the late 60s. And um, um, Anna's mother lived to be 99. And in the last five years of her life, she had to move, move in with her daughter and uh, Anna Biangas. And, um, and then when they cleaned out the apartment, they found the suitcase that had been left there intact for 50 years. And um, it belonged to a prince, a Nigerian artist who was studying at the school. And they spent the last five years basically looking for this um, Nigerian artist. And, you know, they left the suitcase untouched. In the end, they had they decided to open the suitcase that they, considering they might find letters and things that might give them a clue to how to reach the family. And Anna's mom was warned very severely by the prince that he would return. And, I don't, and no one should handle the suitcase, but if he didn't return, perhaps they might be able to open it. So with this in mind, they opened the suitcase and they did a ceremony and <laughs> to ward off uh, <laughs> possible repercussions of opening the suitcase. And, um, and um, it had an incredible treasure trove. If you go to the slide, the fifth slide, please, with the suitcase. Um, you see Yoruba magazines, uh, drawings, letters, an incredible photo archive, a sword, um, a, a, book, a, a book, a book with a, 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 bird, a book with a collection of uh, flowers, a book with a collection of birds. It's it's a really remarkable suitcase, and the reason I I like this the story is because um. It really tells you what we need, how we need to be thinking about the problematics of today. We do not fix this problem by, by without collaboration. Mm -hmm. So next, the next slide, please. Um, retracing the steps. We, we, I invited a friend of mine, Moritz Neumola, Carmen Perez, next slide, please. And, um, I'm sorry, this is really hard for me because I'm I'm really not sure where we are. Uh, it's seen. like Paramount Photographers. This slide is on now. You know what? Let me. The letter. This is really. Let me do this. Is this, yeah. is this better? Mm -hmm. Do you see? It? Do you see it now? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's much better. I'll do this really quickly so that I um, it saves a lot of time. So I just wanted to introduce the team that worked with me because of the pandemic, I couldn't travel to Barcelona to actually see this thing for myself and mm -hmm. to drive that that is true. I reached out to a friend of mine, Maurice Neumola, who's a professor teaching at the university in uh, Barcelona. And he went out and digitized and photographed everything. And he also used it as a training and teaching opportunity for his assistant, Veronica Los Santos Santos, who is a photographer as well. And, um, and so these are some of the contents of the archive. Um, I'll just be very quick about this. Letters, we've done a Facebook call and uh, we've created a bit of a mind map, you know, because we're really desperate to find the family. Mm -hmm. And Anna's one wish is that we return the archive to the family or to the next, to the nearest responsible person they do not want to keep this archive as valuable and as exciting as it is. It's, a, it's an archive that they truly want to return. And that's the reason we've gone on Facebook to put out um, a call, to put out information. We shared on social media platforms, Instagram. And we've been very sensitive about the sort of information that we put out just so that we put out enough to get triggers, but not too much so that the, mm -hmm. the family isn't embarrassed by any of the um, any of the information that is embedded within. Um, and but as we study the archive, we've we've been able to learn a lot about the history of photography in Africa. We've been able to learn about Paramount Photo Studios. We've been able to retrace the map of of the city and how we really informed the journey of Prince Yenuga. Um, 
And um, also, we've been able to identify, create almost a parallel story with some of the iconic events in the history of Nigeria, like the Civil War. And the Nigerian Civil War is so little understood and talked about because there's no real way of dealing with it. We don't have a museum that is centralized that can actually articulate and talk about these traumatic, this traumatic period in the history of the country. And um, through this incredible archive, we see the several ways that the artist deals with those who were in the battlefront and possibly died. You know, he, he makes this incredible um, contamination, if you like, on the draw, on the photos and puts RIP and puts a circle on it. Sometimes he just puts a circle, other times he puts an X on it. Um, I will try to, so this was, this was me in Barcelona two, three weeks ago, visiting Anna for the very first time, visiting the archive, actually handling and, and learning a lot about the prince. I really feel like I know him now. He was a <laughs> genuine character. Um, but some of the, I mean, uh, it's such a short time and I'm not going to try not to speak too long. I'm just going to try and round, round up now. We really learn about repatriation and restitution through this process. We are documenting everything. We want to make it uh, almost a manual by the time we're done for how to deal with complex personal archives. And I think today, um, the biggest question for artists and photographers and for those dealing with contemporary visual culture is, we are producing so much. We're producing so much content. How do we make sense of all of the content that we're producing? How do we build heritage? How do we create artifacts of our time and not just make more banal work that, that do not really speak to the, yeah. the present moment? And um, I believe that through this, through the problems that we're dealing with, the mutual humanist problems that we're dealing with, we can begin to find a new intelligence for this. Um, I also feel like if we, you know, the, the current pandemic situation has really given us an opportunity to reflect on all of the things that we've taken for granted and all of the things that we thought were normal. And building the home museum, for example, we stripped it of all of the hierarchies that we are used to, like, oh, which country are you from? And these borders that we've created for capitalist reasons, for selfish, profitable reasons, oh, you know, how old is this person? Um, you know, we even see it with the pandemic now. We have pandemics named after countries, variant of the pandemic named after countries. So oh, there's the India variant and this is the, you know. So we are in a really difficult place of uh, uh, humanity is in a very complex situation right now. And I believe that art and new methods of generating knowledge especially through local native intelligence, it's truly the way to be staring this shit. Because we have a situation where um, majority world people are deracinated and the rest of the world is sort of, the minority world people are sort of wondering why there's so much chaos. This is, um, this is a, a brief summary of, the, of, the, of what I'm doing right now. And of course, during Lagos Photo 2021, we'll be able to share a bit more about it. And you know, we invite you all to, to participate and engage with it. So thank you for listening. And I hope I, <laughs> I, that was a bit uh, sensible. You know. <laughs> thank you, Azu. That was, that was really interesting. Uh, it's an amazing project because it's, uh, I think both, both of the project, the Uh, Lagos Home Museum as well as the suitcase project uh, show how knowledge can be decolonized and how we have to change our view on objects and it's amazing how this whole world and this whole cosmos evolves out of one little suitcase and that's that's the, the impressing thing. Um, the suitcase is the archive of so many lives and of, of history. Um, witnessing so many um, so many things. Um, speaking about this, uh, I think both both of the projects you're dealing with right now are also kind of it's a counter museum approach somehow. Um, and it 
Do you think, uh, because you were talking about um, the pandemic right now and what we also see is that we are all more diving into this digital virtual world right now. The Lagos Home Museum is a digital museum. Um, you also were digitizing uh, the, the content of this suitcase. Um, how do you think digital archive could work or do you think that this would also work in a museum? Can those things be exhibited or um, what do you think about it? Well, I think um, the idea of what is a museum, what's the functionality of a museum. I mean, a museum really, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, a space that is meant to provide the civic responsibility to everyone not just for people with a, a university degree or high school diploma or whatever it is. It's, a, it's, it's citizens deserve to go to a place where they can learn. And if we're spending a lot of time online today, I think there's a responsibility to build museums online as well. And I don't think it's one or the other. I think, you know, we should be thinking about hybridizing these knowledge forms of knowledge generation because the young people are constantly um evolve in the way they learn and we you know we, if we think we are generating knowledge or archiving knowledge or custodians we need to really you know find ways to engage with them because they are desperate to learn and they're you know constantly consuming information it's just mm -hmm. to make it ready for them and accessible for them mm -hmm. that visual culture really is if you look at video games for example there's so much knowledge shared through video games there's so much um, message in there. There's so much violence propagated there. But if you do not occupy that space, you can't engage. And if you think, if someone says to you as an artist or a curator, well, why don't you think around curating something around video games? And you say, oh, no, no I'm not interested in video games. I'm interested in museums. Well, kids between <laughs> 14 and 18 are spending a lot of time there. You might as well get there and be involved in shaping their sense of space and time rather than leaving it to a capitalist interest. And I'm not against people making money. I'm just saying we mm -hmm. need to be a little bit more awake and aware and vigilant about the spaces that we're leaving uncontested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. There's something actually, Isabel, I would um, like to um, catch on from from what you just said in your um, question with the um, with the question on how how the suitcase and its content can be exhibited like in what form can it have because like me as a curator working in a museum I constantly deal with those questions how to how to exhibit something in, in whole. And of course, like going into like the digital space may sometimes be like the best way to transport the information, the, the, the story in, in the best way. And it's always like, of course, like mediated in a way because you never can like experience the thing itself. It's always, there's always these, this medium in the middle that kind of like, um, explains it or translates it into, into an exhibit in a way. And um, yeah, I'm kind of tied to the institution, of course. So I'm quite limited sometimes because the, the, there's the building, there's the institution, and they kind of expect that there is something there. I can't just say like, ah, okay, um, I found like a digital solution for this. And so the space itself will be empty. You, you can go home now and experience the um, exhibition at home on your computer or, or on your mobile phone. So I really liked the, um, the, the, the challenges like that came with Corona as well, that it wasn't really able, you weren't really able to go to the places. So it kind of like opened up this, space for experiment experimenting for the institution themselves I am, yeah and again about the question how to exhibit the content there immediately there came up an exhibition i did like about five years ago with which developed from a 
tiny note from a letter I found in Georgia. And um, I was there to do an exhibition with like Georgian artists and it kind of like, just like came together and I've never been there before. And I didn't really know the art scene there or anything about it. And so I just found the letter, it was a very, it's, it actually had quite a similar story to the suitcase story because it was just there and um, and the whole sto story evolved from that. And so I used the letter I found in my hotel room under the lying under the bed, which was obviously um, addressed to another person. Um, to yeah, I just like let myself flow and talked to different artists and art practitioners. And so that was the process. The whole exhibition came together in the end. It was like, I don't know, many <laughs> visitors probably had issues to really get into that, really understand the exhibition. But for me, it was like an absolute logical way of dealing, like to kind of like completely communicate openly that I didn't know anything about it and then I, that I'm here now and then I'm just like letting myself go into it with this letter and so this this whole exhibition came together and then the, the exhibits developed because then I went to artists and the studios and talked about the letter and then they told me different like similar stories and the whole exhibition came together like that so I'm telling the story because I think that this is probably um, uh, um, quite unorthodox approach of putting together exhibitions and really letting yourself into the the, the find found object, the found <laughs> the found letter, the found um, um, piece of paper in that case, and to really listen to what it is telling you and where it is leading you, and. Um, yeah, that's because I had like this connection to it. No, it's a great, um, and it's uh, that's why um, I think that um, you know the moment has come because everyone seems to have this feeling that the archive, the things that exist already, the things that we find, the things that were left behind, the ephemeral, there's a lot of meaning in them. And you know, the work of um, George Diago. so congratulations to Kendall for hosting that exhibition. You know, he's a servant and he's a, he's a, he's a, that's the intuition in his work that is so important. And you got, yeah. you read the letter under the bed and it sparked something. And that's what we, yeah. we art can do, spark something that can bring the post question. I'm not, I'm not really, my 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 aim is not to digitize and to put the suitcase online and for people mm. to consume it there. An archive is really um, there's a feeling to an archive. And uh, what do I do? How do we engage with it? How do we trust it? My 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 <clears throat> my interest really is to use it as a point of departure to begin to spark more interesting conversations, and also to find an ethical way to produce new forms of knowledge generation from it. All of the things that I talked about, the Civil War, the studio mm -hmm. photography in Africa, the history of the city itself, the history of art, modernity in Africa, all of the things that are really been, the little that we know in the, in the, about the rest of the, the, the little that the rest of the world knows about Africa has really been informed by photography. And we begin mm -hmm. to turn that on its head. And so one of the things that I am definitely trying to do is to fund and to commission artists who know how to resist and embrace the archive, to react mm -hmm. to this archive. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are certain artists who have a sort of methodology that really is skeptical about the archive, but is also very seduced by it. And these are the sort of artists that I'm looking to commission to share this information with them to see what they produce from it, you know, and how they begin to, because, I mean, my work is to really make the soul fertile for new ways of generating knowledge. And that's where I see my curatorial practice, especially with these sort of, um, uh, these sort of situations where I am at, I'm not, I'm not making any work. Mm. I have to think, Oh, wow, I really like the way Christina Domidel works. I really like the way um, 
Nicolai Lucauza or George Ossidi or, or um, um, Phil Toledano. You know, it's not about international and local and just people who know how to engage with an archive and begin to think about it in a different way. And they've, they've already done it. They, they, I can reference their work that they've done. I know their work. They can produce new ways of what's looking at the same archive. And then we can pretend, we can pre present that as, you know, like your letter, you know, the suitcase becomes that object that has yes. formed, you know, it's like a, a little object that, that thousands of people are dancing around, <laughs> that have mesmerized the crowd. So the content, the, the secrets in the suitcase embedded within become maybe our secret, if you like. And then the knowledge that we generate from it is what we feed off. I mean, you know, the one of the problems we have today with dealing with um, restitution is that these objects that were looted, certain of them, that have a certain intelligence and were made with, um, with ducks and tracks and were made, you know, with the... Uh, to be hidden sometimes at the skirt um, from the from the waist or from the top. The museums that acquired them in, in the Western in the West, to use the West, whatever that means, yeah. put them in um, scanners and decode the secrets of them. And then they make um, they digitize the knowledge and they reproduce that knowledge in books, in in gift shops. In you know in other situations and profit off it, mm. and this sort of occult knowledge that um, that our forebears produced through these objects for play. For instance, it's not all about you know religion or worship or whatever. Mm. They had fun, you know. They were playing and they were entertaining their kids. They were they made theater. They made they engaged and shared knowledge through play, through laughter, through joy. We never talk about that. We only mm -hmm. talk about the spiritual and the voodoo and the blood and the, all of the sort of... And so, we, you know, it's like we are losing so much because we're focusing on the shiny objects. We need to really be thinking about how we bring in the archive and just make it a centerpiece for other forms of knowledge generation. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the, the beauty of your project. And when I look on your website and I look at the... the um, the way you work with fashion, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that excites me about the suitcase, for example. He styled, Prince uh, um, Adewale Yanuga styled these Europeans and wrote uh, and styled them in Nigerian clothes and made a film of it. Then he wrote this letter saying, oh, I'm in Japan now. And he's, you know, he found a bunch of Japanese women in the traditional clothes and he dressed and he staged a narrative around being in Japan, but he was actually in in La Ramba somewhere. In, <laughs> in La I'm, I'm really interested in these, you know, what's the dear Hatma calls critical fabulation. How do we begin to resist, but also embrace? How do we begin mm. to find new ways of understanding that space that we do not have any access to? Mm. You know, the suitcase was left intact for 50 mm. years. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, talking about objects, I think the point is we have to start listening to objects, not starting to trying to understand them in a very logocentric way, in an academic way, like, yeah, finding new categories, because as Fabian Sa says, uh, the Western archive is exhausted, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. And I mean, that's also what talking object is trying to do, like taking the objects as a door opener to a whole world or to a whole cosmos of of knowledge. Um, Nana of Yata Ayim also said, like, this listening is really under-evaluated and we really have to start listening um, to, to find the, the, also the spirit and all the knowledge that is embedded in those, in those objects. Um, maybe because we, you just mentioned also the, um, the fact that looking at the object goes far beyond the questions of restitution and giving back looted objects. It's really, it's, it's much more this whole process of, um, of restitution than just giving back an object. Uh, it's, it's a new perspective on the objects. Maybe it's time that we uh, 
show the first first four minutes from Ariela Azulay's uh, film um, uh, Unlearning Imperial Plunder, because this is really amazing how the, the way she looks, the gaze on objects uh, as they are sitting there in the Western museums, alive somehow waiting to go back to their, to come back to their people. So um, if we can now have the film would be wonderful. that millions of objects never intended for museum display have been looted from all over the world by different imperial powers. It is no secret that many of them have been carefully preserved in pristine museums and are now seen as precious art objects. At the same time, it is no secret that millions of people robbed of tools, masks, and other objects that constituted their world continue to seek a place where they can rebuild their homes. Not only do they have rights to these objects, their rights are inscribed in them. Imagine. Imagine these were the people calling, calling for, for help. help. Alternately, imagine that these figures had not been robbed of the people who made them. Imagine that they could fulfill their function and protect those people who today are called undocumented. Robbing these figures required much violence, deception, and manipulation. The techniques of robbing differed, but many of these imperial actors took advantage of a certain kind of kindness, for a lack of a better term, on the part of the natives, as well as their fellows in Europe. Still today, even though many have some knowledge about the scope of imperial violence, they tend to be shocked whenever they learn about another type of monstrous atrocity. Such types make up the banality of imperialism. And when people argue then and now that they ought not to have happened, they express a naive refusal to accept the normalcy of this banality. Objects themselves are not completely settled down. Look at them and you will see signs of boredom, exhaustion, pain, rage, longing, and disorientation after decades of being kept in places where they do not belong. Bereft of the people among whom they used to exist. Thank you. 
yeah, we choose this um, this short clip uh, because it's really amazing how she, yeah, the way she looks at the, it's not objects, it's subjects. Um, mm -hmm. And she's talking about emotions. And I think this is something we should, we should talk about um, also like this decolonizing labor is emotional labor, our curatorial colleagues from Nairobi uh, who are co-curating the program of unexpected lessons um, gave their part the title decolonizing labor is emotional labor because in the end all those objects for example were stolen from people not from institutions um, and do you think that or how could or no other way around um, I'm very convinced that using art and embracing the archives, finding new ways of, of knowledge production by, um, by acknowledging other forms of knowledge than the academic ones could be a way um, to, to, to come up with this healing process or to start a healing process. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think about this idea. You have to imagine that <clears throat> science really starts with observation and experimentation. And so imagine that a whole canon of knowledge, a whole set of epistem has been denied that room for observation mm. and experimentation. What we have rather is an exotic gaze as though these, these cultures and civilization that have stood the test of time, survived all manner of plagues and earthquakes and disease and are still here, just dropped from, you know, just like, like you know, weeds in the, in the soil. It's, a, it's absurd, you know, we are not mm -hmm. really, if, if we don't observe it and learn, not like the anthropologist of the 19th century and the 18th mm -hmm. century, I'm talking about like the anthropologist of the 21st century where we are all curious about each other. You know, well, you know the, uh, the anthropologists of today, you know, the hunger and the contemporary visual intelligence that we all have because we are all more visually aware. We understand the way images work. You know, we are constantly reading um, the situation much more aware. I mean, today, young people are have a way of looking at images that is so different to the way we looked at it 20 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 30 years ago, just because they have, they've seen much more. I think yeah. that it's, it's absurd that we're not really opening up that, that opportunity to really mm. tap into these forms of knowledge of the generation that have been left obscure over, over time. And the truth is, you know, if information is coming out today about how a lot of science and a lot of knowledge that, that is assimilated into the sort of the history of uh, that it's sort of accepted as orthodox learning have actually come from stealing borrowing if you like from so-called obscure um, mm -hmm. uh, situations or sites and then hiding them very very well and suppressing them as still you know they are they've exhausted that archive those archives, we need to connect them and breathe life into them. Yeah, mm -hmm. no. yeah. What just like came up to my mind is that like the curator, like it's the word comes actually from to care for and museums until today <laughs> uh, um, say like, there's like this huge discussion um, at, at ICOM on what, uh, on, the new, on the new museum definition. And um, so many argue that like the collection is like the heart of the museum and um, which yeah, I would like partly agree, but I don't know what this actually really mm -hmm. means like. And then, of course, the curator was like traditionally the person that took care of the collection. And um, definitely that, what, what, what does that mean? What does this caring for the collection or the archive, like what does introduce, that actually mean? Yeah, I'd like to introduce another word, um, commissaire, which is... <laughs> Mm -hmm. French, if it actually comes from a policeman. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. 
But that's yeah. the the vigilance that we need as a curator, because we know that objects have history and objects yeah. are supercharged with energy and knowledge. So the policemen need to police these objects as though they are people. It needs to usher them around, it needs to guide them, it needs to be vigilant about you know how they are. So the concern is also a really interesting word. And of course, it's a different, but you know, it's a different way of looking at it, but it's the same object that we're talking about now, if you think of the yeah. word an object. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah, what is caring for objects? And again, we are at this discussing this Western notion of a museum mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. possessing so you just have the knowledge if you possess the objects uh, it's like a fetish somehow and you lose everything else like spirituality oral oral history all these aspects yeah and that's also why the why why europe or the west is is it's so hard for them to give back the objects it's still this i have to possess yeah. it yeah because I'm the collection is the heart and if you yeah. give the collection away then there's no museum anymore so mm -hmm. this of course is like a real um hope there are yeah. there, obviously like um other um, approaches to mm -hmm. that what a museum is and yeah. um, um, luckily the definition changes but still it is so um, so so hard this this idea that the, that the museum has to have a collection and that that's the heart and if you take mm -hmm. it away then the museum dies doesn't so exist it's anymore like <laughs> yeah but that's what you that, 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 sorry go on I was that that just made me think of um, something that I was that um, is an ideology that Mao Zedong had in his there had to be whatever happened in, in communist China. There had to be a party. You know, it had to mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. No matter what the chaos on the street was, whether it, the, they had to have a, there was a the necessity to have a party. It's like saying the necessity to have a collection, and mm -hmm. it's an obsession with this formal structure mm -hmm. that is yeah. you know, deeply rooted in ideology that mm -hmm. makes yeah. it difficult for us to shift and to pivot to begin to think about how those formalized ways prevent us from getting access to the knowledge that others have held mm -hmm. fresh. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's, a, that's also what you turn upside down with the home museum, like uh, making yeah. the homes and the things in the homes to the to the museum, like you yeah. really turn it upside down. That's what that's why this this project you and Clementine did was so so extremely important. Thank you. And what I also love about the Home Museum is, um, of course, that as you already mentioned it, that um, it also did something to the people who um, participated in it, that they also um, had the chance to, to change their, their um, own perception on what a museum is and what objects are worth of being part of the museum and which ones are not. So that, of course, like this whole topic of decolonization we are talking about and um, we're talking about from like a mostly, a, I don't know, in Europe, from a European perspective, of course, but this de decolonization is something that also needs to take part in um, like on the African continent in the different societies so that there needs to be like this re revaluing <laughs> of, um, of like the own, the own things, objects, history and that it's not that the end should not be to copy like a european institution <laughs> to bring mm -hmm. it on the continent and do like exactly what to kind of copy the issues like europe is dealing with in a way so it yeah you know, mm -hmm. i think that's very important the, yeah i absolutely completely agree with you it's really about making the familiar or the more familiar and the unfamiliar yeah. so you know, they say that a fish swimming in an ocean does not know what water is. It's just swimming. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're surrounded by your own cosmology, but you're yeah. not really attuned to it. You need to be to pay attention to it. So when you're out of it, you know what you've lost. How do you, you know, the 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 relic diplomacy that happens at the high end, where politicians and government people are talking to each other, we're not involved with that. 
and you know the intellectualization of what really belongs to the people means that you know certain people get fed and are, and are giving workshops and are traveling around the world and are just sort of dancing around restitution but really it's about the people and so that's really the logic of the whole medium really mm. the responsibility yeah. to the people and that's what i love about um your website and the way you've you know it's breaking down these hierarchy and so letting mm. people find meaning in them turning the objects into subjects thank you for that yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you thank you so we get a sign that we have to already, where's the hour come to an end? <laughs> yeah. um, we need a second edition, Azul. <laughs> and dear Kindle, we need a second edition to talk about yes, all, the, all the issues connected to the question of archives, of objects, yeah. of objects like subjects, of decolonizing knowledge, uh, decolonizing uh, memory. Um, We have to come to an end, Marit and Azu. Yeah, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It's been a real pleasure getting to um, share this, this hour with you all. And I hope um, we get to meet each other soon. Yes, yes, we will. We will. I also thank you for participating. And we thank the Kindle for having us, for inviting us uh, to have this talk. Thank you to... Uh, to the technicians also for for making this possible here online and yeah we wish you all uh, a nice evening and as uh, Katja Kynos already said don't miss the George Adiakbo exhibition at Kindle because this is really a very very good example or nice experience about discovering discovering alternative meanings of objects by by looking at these assemblages uh, George Adiakbo has created mm. at, at Kinder. And also like to practice to just let yourself be in the exhibition and discover connections and meanings and stories. And listen to objects. Listen to objects <laughs> <laughs> and trust like the process, mm. probably. Yeah, thank you also from my side. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much and um, have a nice evening. and. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.